Welcome to this week's Hagley History Hangout. At the Hagley Museum and Library, we document the unfolding history of American business and technology and their impact on the world. My name is Max Muller, and I am the curator of published collections in the library. Through this series, we will draw on Hagley's extensive research collections to tell you surprising stories about our past. My talk today will explore promotional comic books at Hagley Library. And the title, as you can see, is called Bam Pow, just to make it exciting. So I will say after that that my title is a little bit misleading. Uh, there's usually not a lot of action taking place in these comics. Uh, I also apologize for some poor quality images. Uh, comics are printed on uh, often grainy and poor quality paper, and so the scanned images don't always come out as clearly as you would expect. Uh, Finally, some of the information, it's been tough to find uh, information, especially about behind the scenes production of comic books and so on. So some of that information is uh, a little sketchy and uh, a little bit of conjecture thrown in there as well, based on the available evidence that I have. So I know what you're thinking. Comic books at Hagley doesn't seem to be what you'd expect. Well, it's true, we have some. But I have to say, uh, comics are all the rage these days. Uh, you can see them everywhere. Uh, so why not Hagley as, as well? Uh, you can see it in print, especially in the movies and popular culture. They're all over the place, all kinds of superheroes. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, I do have a pop quiz. So I wanna ask the audience if they think this is a promotional comic book. Well, the answer is no. This is not a promotional comic book. So now that we have that settled, I wanna talk about the comics that we have at the library that I've seen um, through, the, through the history of my career at Hagley. I've been at Hagley for uh, about 13 or 14 years now. Um, for the longest time, I only knew of two comic books, and the first one was called The Mighty Atom, starring Reddy Kilowatt. The story of electricity from amber to atoms. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I found another comic book called The Flintstones at the New York World's Fair. And I do apologize to the audience. I don't know how to move my little picture at the corner out of the way of the images. Uh, but if you come to the library, I'll be happy to show you anything that you might miss. Um, so for the longest time, these were the only two comics that I knew of, and I had found these accidentally in my travels through the stacks. Uh, we often do uh, what we casually call show and tells for uh, groups visiting the library, students uh, and teachers and their, their students as well uh, coming through or VIPs and people who we want to uh, show off the collections to. And uh, in my travels, I found these two comics and I trotted these out fairly regularly because I thought they were really interesting. Um, but I never, I never gave it much thought beyond the fact that aren't these kind of funny and, and quirky kind of things to show. And they always got a little bit of a reaction you know, from the audience that would be in attendance. Uh, but that's as far as I really thought about these items. Uh, and so that's what I knew. And that was the truth. Uh, and that's the way things were for a few years. Um, finally, I would occasionally stumble on one or two more and I'd say, oh, I have a new show and tell item to, to present. But other than that, I didn't really do much with these materials. Finally, a new collection came in uh, maybe about five years ago and it had another comic book in it. And then finally the light bulb went off in my brain at least. Uh, and I thought, you know, what are these things? And, and how many of them are there? Uh, who produced them? You know, how many industries may have participated in, in producing such comic books and, or purchasing such comic books for their, to promote their, their business and their products? Um, so it was really interesting all of a sudden. And I realized that, uh, you know, maybe I should be exploring this avenue a little bit further. And as curator of published collections, it also occurred to me at the same time that if anyone was going to develop um, a sudden interest in 
promotional comic books, uh, I was well positioned to do so because uh, I had the authority to collect published materials for Hagley Library. And uh, these certainly count as published materials and they certainly count as business publications. And so there seemed to be an interesting story to uh, uh, pursue here. Um, now, not only did I not know anything about promotional comic books, I did not know anything about comic books in general. I've never collected them in my life. Uh, I was never really interested. Uh, but these comics started grabbing my attention. Uh, and I think, frankly, they became interesting because of how mundane the subject matter is. Uh, this is not uh, comic books like Batman or Superman or really where there's a lot of exciting action taking place. This is uh, corporate America trying to uh, impose their values on on society through comics and trying to uh, maybe make that uh, message fun in the process. Did they succeed? I don't really know. Maybe it's up to you. We can all decide that at the end of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so that's where this all came from. And but first, I do want to also go over a little bit of comic book history that I've managed to piece together to maybe get us all up to speed. So political cartoons like the one you see uh, on this screen uh, really evolved in the, um, in the 1750s, um, in, at least in British and American newspaper circles. Um, so they were political cartoons that uh, functioned sort of like uh, illustrated uh, editorials where people could post commentary in the newspapers, maybe in a semi quasi anonymous format they're making it fun and trying to uh, illustrate maybe a, uh, a concept that, that maybe if they voiced it directly in public uh, as, as an individual, they might get into trouble for libel or sedition and so on. But, but to do so maybe somewhat anonymously and in cartoon format in the newspapers was a way for people to maybe skirt around those types of uh, laws and to make their point. Um, so they usually offer subtle criticism uh, with humor and satire, uh, hope, hopefully to the point where people can maybe laugh at themselves and not necessarily uh, uh, get embittered or pursue legal action. Um, and uh, so this is sort of where cartoons in uh, uh, published format seem to start as far as I could tell. And uh, the medium began to develop into the later part of the um, 17th, 1700s and 1800s. By the time you get into uh, the late 1800s, you start seeing uh, a developing industry around the, the concept of a comic strip. Uh, now, a comic strip is a little bit different. It's usually not necessarily political, and it's not necessarily just an editorial comment. Um, you start getting a series uh, of, uh, of uh, comics produced uh, based around certain characters. Uh, they're usually humorous in intent, and that is sometimes the only intent, is to provide humor and to maybe uh, incidentally get people interested in buying the larger newspaper in general if they want to read the funny pages. Uh, so cartoons, um, you know, uh, comic strips, I should say, uh, were really um, the first area where you start to see humor being produced for its own sake in a paper. Um, here we have an example of the Katzen Jammer Kids. Uh, which was a syndicated American comic strip that debuted in 1897. Uh, here the characters were recent German immigrants who had not yet learned proper English. So they mixed bad English with remnants of poor German to, I guess, kind of poke fun at these characters. And the little children, uh, the kids themselves in the comic are uh, kind of crazy and they get into all kinds of trouble uh, to uh, make the audience laugh. But I should say, in the end, they always get their comeuppance. So you always see them being spanked or punished for their, their wrongdoings because you couldn't, back in those days especially, you couldn't have kids acting like that and getting away with it. Uh, you could laugh at it, but then they had to, uh, they had to have justice served. Another example of an early comic strip is Buster Brown. Now, I think more people are familiar with Buster Brown uh, than the Cuts and Jammer kids. Uh, 
but I, I'm curious, and I can't really ask the audience now, but I would ordinarily ask, uh, how many people knew of Buster Brown as an independent comic strip versus uh, uh, a promotional character that would be used to, produce, to promote business uh, products like the Buster Brown shoes and so on. Um, so here we have the original comic strip or a copy of the original comic strip for Buster Brown. And you can see he always gets into trouble similar to the Cots and Jammer kids. Uh, he's here seeing a really nasty looking mule behind a fence and of course he's going to get into trouble and his dog knows it and you can read uh, the comic strip there. Uh, the dog knows he's going to get into trouble. And again, ultimately, he does get into all kinds of trouble. But at the end, again, justice is served. He learns his lesson. Uh, he decides he's going to bed without supper. And he resolves that he's never going to depend upon his own judgment again. And he's never going to get in trouble. And so on. So this is sort of the stage of comics around the turn of the uh, 20th century uh, in the newspapers. Now, as I mentioned previously, Buster Brown obviously was so popular that he also became identified, very strongly identified with the Buster Brown Shoe Company. And you can see here an, uh, an example of a button uh, promoting that link. And you can also see uh, an image from a trade catalog that we have with the style stars of Buster Brown's Easter Parade. You can see some of the Buster Brown shoes that he was used to promote as well. Tying into that, Fortune Magazine um, was new. Uh, uh, I think it was first produced in 1930 or in the very early 1930s. Uh, here in April 1933, we have an issue of Fortune Magazine. And it was very influential business publication. It's beautiful uh, if you ever get the chance to uh, look at early uh, issues of Fortune magazine. They spared no expense even during the depression to produce a really nice high quality publication. If you ever want to see it, we have a full run of it at, at the Hagley Library. Uh, in April 1933, they ran a, a story called The Funny Papers. And this article trumpeted the arrival of comics as a force to be reckoned with in the world of advertising and business. So similar to the Buster Brown phenomenon we were just discussing. It was, so it was, a world, it was a force to be reckoned with and possibly a force also to fear as well, according to this article. Um, this was probably a surprising topic for serious discussion for the readers of Fortune in that day. Uh, the article recognizes the enormous profit potential, but casts the notion of relying on comic strip material to sell products in a negative light even going so far as to suggest that advertisers who utilize comics are violating unspoken rules of advertising decorum and bringing themselves down to the level of comics. So you can see, here's one of the images from that article on the funny papers. And in this image, you can see uh, there are all kinds of cartoon characters famous in the day, such as Popeye and Felix the Cat, and I can see Mickey Mouse, and I can see the Cats and Jammer kids tied up at the bottom. Uh, and in the middle, holding uh, Popeye's arm is a blank person, and if you can read that, it, it says, your advertising. So insert your advertising here, along with any character who is available for sale in order to promote your wares. And this is the phenomenon that they were trying to explore in this article. But again, it, it was really cast in a somewhat negative light. It, it, it didn't, it, it kind of was bemused. The article has a bemused tone where it really just doesn't quite understand what's happening here. Uh, why people would want to associate uh, their serious products with such characters. Uh, what's the point other than it's profitable, but you know, it's questionable at the same time. So the article concludes, so it may be that the funny advertisements will thrive, prosper, and become more numerous. Certainly, they seem to be well in tune with their times. Meanwhile, they remain an odd commentary on the value of advertising dignity and taste. If it is the bull that sells the merchandise, what happens to the china shop then? So, very serious stuff. Around the same time, we start getting into another category of publications uh, which are leading in the evolution towards uh, these promotional uh, uh, comic strips, 
comic books, I should say. Uh, and we get into the notion of uh, premiums or giveaways. Uh, I'm going to show an image here. This is an instance of a comic book. This is from a slightly later date, I believe, in the 1940s. But this gives you the idea of how some of the early comic books were presented. Uh, again, using the same idea where uh, businesses suddenly realize that these comic book characters and so on were useful and could be used to draw attention to their products. And so they would, uh, Fryhofer's uh, Bakery, for instance, here, uh, managed to produce a comic book, which uh, basically has nothing to do with Fryhofer's or their, or their bakery products, but it has all sorts of uh, several little uh, comic book uh, selections in, within it uh, uh, for the various characters you see on the cover. Um, independently doing what they would have done, whether or not Fryhofer's was able to sponsor this uh, publication or not. So it's somewhat of an incidental tie-in where they, they slap their name on top of the cover and um, uh, distribute it and hope that people would take away uh, from this comic book a little bit of fun and also remember the name of the product as well. And you can see here's another one, Crossley's House of Fun. This is from the Crossley division for Avco, Better Products for Happier Living. And this comic, you can see there is a little bit more uh, tie-in with the actual products that, that uh, the Crossley may have been producing. Uh, these were premium uh, comics, which were available for free. Uh, but a mail-in coupon or other response would often be required from the reader in order to receive a copy if they wanted one. So this is somewhat of a natural extension of the newspaper comic strip. Businesses were funding these books, but it still predated the modern, mostly they predated the modern comic book as we know it. Now, this is Julian Proskauer. He is credited as being the man who developed comic books for industry, which is what he termed it. And this is what we are calling promotional comic books in this uh, presentation. Mr. Proskauer uh, was born in 1893, uh, and he is primarily remembered as an American magician and an author. And I think that's what this image is. I think he's dressed up as a magician, not just casually working. Um, but uh, so in addition to being a magician, he was friends with Harry Houdini, uh, and he was well known for, at the time, for writing some books about magic, and he also uh, liked to expose uh, fakes and frauds and people who are into spiritualism and so on. Uh, in addition to that, he also worked in the publishing industry, uh, and he came up with this notion of, I guess, taking uh, comics one step further for business and came up with this notion for comic books for industry. The very first comic that he pitched along these lines was one to the Seagram's company. So in July 1936, Proskauer made his first sale to David Davies, who was then the advertising manager for Seagram's Distillers Corporation. And they decided that uh, Seagram's would purchase 3 million copies of the Seagram's Merrymakers in time for the 1936-1937 Christmas season. And you see the headline here. Uh, now, it just so happens that Hagley uh, holds the archives for the Seagram company. And so uh, I did not know that we had this particular comic in the library until doing my research. And when I came across Seagram's, I was very excited and figured we have to have a copy of this very first promotional comic strip, comic book. And sure enough, we do. Um, so here it is, volume one, number one, for the Seagram's Merrymaker. Um, let's see, in printing news, uh, noted this development as well at the time, uh, I should say in 1945, and they said, thus was a new industry born, looking back on the development of these uh, promotional comic books. Now it's interesting, they produced 3 million copies of this Seagram's Merrymaker, and Hagley is the only library that holds any copies recorded for the Seagram's Merrymaker. So again, if you want to see any of these comics, Hagley's a great place to come and visit. Now I can show you some other images from the Seagram's Merrymaker from this first issue. Uh, and the interesting thing is, uh, let's see, it produces, it shows various tricks, games, fun party ideas, 
uh, all presented here. Uh, it has graphic illustrations, it has humor, it has product placement. So it has a lot of the, the uh, concepts that are involved with uh, promotional comics, but it doesn't really look like a comic book. Uh, this looks to me like more like a newspaper, frankly. Um, and if you saw it, you would agree it's very large. Um, and it doesn't present itself in a narrative format the way a comic book does. But this is still credited as being the first uh, uh, attempt, I suppose, at uh, developing a promotional ca uh, comic book. And incidentally, just to show you, uh, here's the back, you can see a little bit more from this publication and you can see uh, various recipes for different types of wine and drinks and so on that you might be interested in that you could use your secret products uh, to make. Incidentally, I should also add that Julian Pruskauer's uh, uh, comic for Seagram's company was produced the year or two before Superman was produced. This is the very first modern day superhero comic book. Uh, just to give you a, uh, an idea of where we are historically and, and how these uh, uh, publications were developing simultaneously. Now I mentioned that Julian Proskauer gets all the credit, but I have to say what you're looking at right here is something else we have in Hagley's collections. This is a publication called Durham Whiffs, published by Blackwell's Durham Tobacco Company, volume one, number one. So again, the very first issue of this publication, but this one dates to 1878. And if you study it the way I'm looking at it, uh, it's hard to argue that this is not basically the same thing that Julian Proskauer produced much later, and yet he gets all the credit. So I don't know if this history is fully developed or if there, uh, if there is more research to be done, but um, as, at least as far as claiming who gets credit for such developments and so on, maybe this was a, a, a development ahead of its time, but this certainly looks like a comic book to me. Uh, we, we have cartoon characters, graphic illustrations, humor, there's product placement again. Uh, you can see there, uh, the product uh, placement here. You could also see there are comic illustrations inside uh, with various nursery rhymes being uh, altered in order to uh, have them link more directly to the product being sold in a humorous way. Again, there's no narrative format to this. Uh, the way modern comic books do, but uh, again, you can at least get the sense that, that this was a, a, a concept that was out there and yet just had not quite been pulled together and pulled into a, a, a coherent business strategy. And there are incidentally two copies for this publication available in libraries around the country, uh, one being at Hagley and the other being at the New York Public, Li Public Library. So, Let's talk about modern day, well, mid 20th, mid, mid 20th century promotional comics, what they look like. So Julian Proskauer hit on this idea, maybe at a more fortuitous time when people were ready to listen to it or, or maybe potentially profit from it. Um, the big hurdle they faced while Superman was flying around and Batman was being developed and so on was how do you make industrial processes exciting? That's a great question. And you can see here are a few covers of different promotional comics. First is Adventures in Electricity, and that was produced by General Electric. Then we have Steel, produced for General Motors. And then we have another one here. I'm sorry, you can't read it. It's called The Wonder Book of Rubber. So how do you do this? How do you make this fun? Well, you can maybe use uh, fun graphics, like comics would uh, lead you to expect. You can use a lot of exclamation points, like you see here in the title. Uh, you could also build a narrative that focuses on curiosity and trying to explain the industry to a child. So, I mentioned General Electric already. Uh, you can see here, there's a few other comics also produced by General Electric I wanted to show you. Adventure into the Future, Land of Plenty and Conquerors of Space. 
there were many, many comic books produced uh, in, for businesses. Uh, however, there are some businesses which really took this uh, sales avenue a lot more seriously than others. General Electric produced many comic books, and so they are probably the heaviest producer of comics. Uh, and you can see several examples of those here. To give you a sense of the types of products they were selling and the types and the way they were trying to reach their, their target audiences. Uh, the Association of American Railroads also produced many uh, promotional uh, comic books as well. As you can see here, Railroads Deliver the Goods, Special Agent, get into all the mystery and drama of what's going on on the tracks, and uh, Ride the High Iron, as you, see, as you see here. Again, another very heavy user of comic books as a medium to, to sell their products and promote their, their business. So in, a, in addition, however, as I mentioned, there are many other companies that were doing this, and I want to show you some of my favorites. Uh, this one is called Major in a Pack, The Space Ace. And you can see here, this is one of the few promotional comic books which actually does get into the whole Bam Pow uh, uh, aspect of comic books where there are people fighting and actually dramatic action taking place. Uh, in a Pack, in case you didn't know, uh, you can see here's a little more action. Inapac was a company that produced uh, chocolate milk, I believe, with uh, vitamin-packed chocolate milk. Here it is, gang, the best chocolate drink in the world. Try it. And so you can see this was a, 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 a one of the more exciting comic books that was actually trying to reach a target audience that actually would use the product that they were promoting in their comic books as well. So this, these comic books were, were you know, mostly targeted at children, but then children were also the ones who would want to consume a uh, chocolate drink for the most part. And uh, you can see that here. Now this incidentally was a comic, which was at one time, this was a very rare comic, very difficult one to find. And it was very, it was priced accordingly. Uh, so in trying to purchase catalogs for the library, I've come across a whole range of product prices and so on, depending on how rare or valuable or, or hard to find some of these materials are. At one time, this was considered uh, a very rare catalog or uh, comic book, I should say. But in some time um, in the last 15 or 20 years, someone found a whole box full of these. And so all of a sudden there were 500 copies which were flooding the market. So the price for this individual comic dropped dramatically. It's just an interesting side story to, to let you in a little bit on the process of purchasing these materials and trying to look for them online. Another fun comic book, Shooting's Fun for Everyone. The why, where, when, and how of rifle shooting for boys and girls. You see here, there's family fun in a gun. Seems to me a very different message than what you would hear today. But you can see all kinds of different uh, ways they're trying to make this comic, uh, or I guess this product exciting in a comic strip format uh, to their audiences and trying to show people how different ways you could use a gun and, and setting up targets and hunting and family fun for everyone and so on. Here's another favorite, which is a rather unappetizing tar uh, topic for discussion, how meat moves to market from the open range to the kitchen range. Uh, again, it's hard to imagine how children might have taken uh, such a comic and whether they would have at all been interested or not. Uh, but you can see here a young boy being led through the meatpacking factory in order to uh, see how meat is produced. and. Uh, uh, hopefully his attention will not wander and hopefully if he can't go on the actual tour himself, then hopefully this comic would satisfy his curiosity about the process. Now in looking at all of these uh, various comic books that we have at Hagley and doing research into this, I did start to notice that there were somewhat typical features in the way these comics tend to be presented. So there's usually a mascot involved because again, how do you make a business process exciting to children? You know, Superman may not be in the comic, but you've got to have something for them to maybe grab onto to understand, hopefully to make them interested and to incidentally learn something, whether or not they want to learn or not when they're looking at this comic. So a mascot is usually in place. 
And you can see, for instance, Ready Kilowatt being an early example of a mascot or a comic character that uh, is still widely known today, uh, who would be hopefully a way of making the comic strip a little more accessible to children. You could also have the story of water supply featuring this character, Willing Water, who then proceeds to tell people that, uh, uh, you know, they might want to read further by learning what he says here. Hey, on page five, I made a mistake. I said a liter of water is a little less than a quart. Sorry about that, it's a little more. I guess maybe, maybe that's appealing and maybe children want to learn more from Willing Water. In addition to a mascot, like we've seen, you often get tours through history, which again is a way that the companies thought might be of interest to children and they might want to learn the entire history of, of how these things uh, came to, how modern life came to be. So they'll go through history and in this case you see uh, uh, Native Americans uh, who are working with copper uh, and they were, uh, and according to this uh, comic here, it says at the time Columbus made his voyage, the American Indians in many ways were as advanced in working copper as the Europeans. And then it moves on from there to tell you the history of the copper industry and how it's developed. Or you see again another example here, uh, and this is for uh, the story of measurement. Uh, this is a comic strip which shows uh, the history of how measurement was, was practiced over time from ancient Europe and uh, the Middle East down through the present day. And then if you haven't lost your child target audience yet with a mascot and touring through history, then you start showing the process of, of producing products uh, in business or uh, uh, the business story itself. And you can see here uh, another comic example with the first all-American turbojet, uh, you know, maybe trying to appeal uh, to young boys, showing them what a turbine is, and then showing them how the turbine actually works and how it produces pressure and so on. Or you can see here, this is an example of a power plant. Uh, and you can see, in case you're wondering what those towers look like as you drive by, you can see here a diagram of what happens to the uh, water as it's being uh, 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 used in the power plant in order to produce steam. And then finally, on top of that, there would be some kind of product placement with the advertisement as well. Uh, so here uh, you see in a comic book about bread, uh, you see a leader among flowers named after a leader among men, Robin Hood brand flower. Or in this case, you can see uh, Nestle's uh, chocolates being sold at the counter of a, uh, of a uh, candy shop. Uh, and this is from a, a Nestle produced comics, uh, comic strip about their chocolate and, how the, and, and the history of chocolate and how it's been produced uh, and, and how it gets to the supermarket near you. So that's in general the way uh, these, most of these comics look. Now I wanted to spend a time looking at one specific company which was producing some of these comics to give you a better sense of this process. Cool. So Commercial Comics was, cre was created by someone named Malcolm Ader who lived from 1915 to 1992. He established Malcolm Ader Productions in 1946 and this uh, comic book, The History of Gas was his first comic done for the American Gas Association in 1947. And this character you see here, Miss Flame, was a gas industry trademark for over 20 years. So uh, this comic uh, uh, was fairly influential in, in terms of uh, trying to be a, a means of promoting the gas industry. Uh, originally, Ader sold the concept of his comic books but as his business grew, he was usually approached by customers to develop comics for them. So comics like this were very influential, at least in getting attention from other businesses that would potentially want to market their, their own products. And then they would contract with uh, commercial comics in order to have something produced and created. Um, 
after producing the scripts and farming the artwork out to several different artists, uh, Malcolm Ader uh, would then publish and deliver the books to his clients for distribution. Uh, his name, the company name changed to Commercial Comics in the 1950s, and we have several examples of their work uh, at Hagley Library. Now, Commercial Comics earned about $100,000 per year at the height of its uh, popularity. Uh, Ader was the only full-time employee, but he employed an additional staff of five artists and eight clerical workers on a freelance basis in order to uh, keep this running. His industrial books had an average circulation of one million copies. And this heyday arrived in the 1960s um, when there was a brief popularity of political comic books. So in addition to these business related comic books, he also did uh, produce comic books for politicians who were trying to promote their careers. Um, and then it was later followed by uh, educational and informational comic books, which were produced for various branches of the federal government and so on. So he was always looking for clients, but it gives you a sense of how this industry was uh, operating. Incidentally, there are three copies known for this particular uh, comic strip and Hagley does hold one. And you can see some more images from Miss Flame and the interior of the comic strip. Again, we have Miss Flame as a mascot. You can see uh, how this, uh, basically this comic strip, uh, comic book sells the, the concept of electricity and uh, uh, gas production through, uh, through time, starting in 1817 in Baltimore uh, and moving forward. Uh, and you can see instances of that in the uh, comic strip as well as you move forward. And as you go on, you can see uh, modern day appliances uh, and Miss Flame telling you how remarkable it is that such products exist. And we have uh, the gas industry to thank for the wonders of the modern world, as you can see here. And that is her story. She's at your service. So hopefully children have gotten through to the end of the comic book in order to get the, the full message of, of what the American gas industry wanted them to learn. Here's another example of a, a comic book created by uh, Commercial Comics. This one was done in 1950 for the United States Steel Corporation. It's called Joe, the Genie of Steel. Again, you can see all those common elements that we discussed. We have Joe, who is the mascot. And you get a little bit of a story here about a young boy who has to, uh, who wants to win a bike. Uh, so he enters a, into an essay contest for the iron and steel industry, but he doesn't know what to write. And so who does he turn to? Well, it turns out that Joe, the genie of steel shows up in order to explain where all this iron and steel came from and, and who do we have to thank for it? And so he takes uh, this young boy on a tour through a tour through history and a tour of the production process as we discussed in order to give him real insights into what this is and, and, and why the world is the way it is when, when, when he was alive in 1950. Right down to the Bessemer process so you can really get up close and personal and see what this is all about. And finally, he's inspired, even though Joe is gone, he opens his books and begins his essay I'm pretty sure he's gonna win that bike. Now, in addition to, we just looked at commercial comics, uh, trying try to understand a little bit about where these comics are coming from, who's producing them. But I wanted to look at a client as well. So I mentioned earlier that General Electric uh, produced a lot of comics, uh, as well as the American Association of Railroads. Well, NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers also produced a handful of comics. And at Hagley Library, we also have the corporate archives on deposit for the National Association of Manufacturers. So we have some of these comics to show. Now the National Association of Manufacturers is a trade association. So they're not necessarily promoting a product, but they are producing or they are selling an industry and they're selling a way of life. So they're interested in producing comics in order to get people on the same wavelength as they are. 
So here we have uh, one example of a comic book. It's called Watch Out for Big Talk. This, this was created for the NAM in 1950 by another company called General Comics Incorporated. Now I was unable to find any real information about General Comics, uh, so I don't have much to say about them. But again, focusing on this from the point of view of the National Association of Manufacturers, you start to get a sense of what it is that they're trying to get out of this comic book and others like it. Again, they're trying to sell a point of view. From their perspective, anyone with an open mind would, be, would naturally see eye to eye with the people at the National Association of Manufacturers. So you can see here, here we have some guy up on a pedestal out in public talking to, the, to an audience. Uh, and he says, all this nation needs, my friends, is the right plan, the right formula. And then you have sort of Joe Everyman American in the middle of the crowd here who's very skeptical. He says, geez, the, the right formula. Where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah, it's what a carnival pitch man says. And it's what other people say, other evil people who might have things to, who might be trying to sell you things that you don't need. People like Adolf Hitler. Watch out for such evil characters. Watch out for other evil characters like Stalin, for instance, again, trying to sell the public on things that they think they need and that they think the government should provide. You might also want to watch out for other evil characters like American politicians who might be promoting big government. Uh, you don't want to take baby steps towards uh, ending up in a situation like uh, Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. Uh, so these are things that the, the National Association of Manufacturers was very concerned about. And so you have to watch out for big talkers like this. What you should do is think about what the founding fathers were doing. Now, gentlemen, we must all hang together or assuredly we shall all hang separately. Never mind the fact that the founding fathers didn't agree with each other, but you know, the, the NAM wants you to think like them and to think about American liberty and to think about uh, uh, steering clear of uh, big government and uh, evil uh, anti-capitalist ideas. So we're not gonna have it, we're not gonna stand for any of those planned economy pipe dreams that you see here. And then the crowd all starts falling in line behind Joe America, who was uh, in the audience there. Be true Americans. And you can see here, a good American citizen will always watch out for big talk, always keep informed on issues of the day, always register and vote thoughtfully, always guard his freedoms and the freedom of others. So they think like the National Association of Manufacturers. And I suppose from their point of view, if, if they can get people to think along these lines, then they're priming uh, young children to, to think like informed adults when they become old enough in order to vote and to exercise their own judgment. Now, the NAM also produced several other comics, which I suppose means that they were a happy client. You can see here, Fight for Freedom, the picture story of man's endless struggle for liberty, or Your Fights on the Home Front, How Nations Fall Through Unsound Money, and the story behind your liberty. These comics date from 1949 through 1952. So again, all of the same time period post World War II, uh, during the cold, early stages of the Cold War, again, trying to promote American values. Now there are no metrics really to suggest that any of the preceding comic books that we've discussed uh, were effective. It's really hard to tell. Uh, did children really uh, read these? Did children care about these? Uh, were they, uh, were they simply thrown away or recycled or uh, uh, did, did, did children gravitate towards superhero comics instead? Probably. Maybe these worked uh, for some audiences, maybe not. It's hard to tell. Um, they simply exist now as uh, collectibles and as print artifacts. Um, we're trying to collect them at Hagley Library because uh, they are an interesting uh, window on uh, business practices, especially in the mid uh, 20th century. Um, 
and the collection is growing uh, from those initial two that I learned of in Hagley collections. Uh, the collection now is around 150, I believe. Um, so we find more all the time and we are adding them to the collections in order for people to uh, study and perhaps do more research into uh, this publication process. Uh, hopefully this collection will be uh, useful to scholars and business historians uh, in, the, in the years to come. And if you're at all interested, of course, we want you to come in to the library to see them. And you can see here, this is a list of all the different types of uh, uh, industries which uh, have produced comics. Uh, this is just a, a selection of them. Uh, and I was trying to show the range of, of products and, and industries that were employing this uh, uh, business tactic of producing uh, uh, comic books uh, in order for, for industri industrial purposes in order to attract uh, children. So it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating and there's, there's no end to this. I keep finding more all the time. Uh, if you've, so come again to the library and to see any of these if, if you're interested. Now, if you've made it this far through my talk, I do have one final comic to show you. Uh, if you can see me in the window up here, I've got another comic book on hand. So even though I'm uh, practicing social distancing and, and working from home, uh, I did take uh, some work home with me in order to uh, continue cataloging materials and, produce, and producing new online records for the library collections. And in the process, I had to take some boxes of materials home with me. And I found this comic book while I've been at home. And it turns out this is a duplicate. So we already had a copy of this at Hagley Library that I purchased about three years ago. Um, so here's a second copy if you're interested. And so it gave me a nice handy little show and tell item for the talk that we're doing today. And this is called Colonel Keds and his exciting Bell Rocket Belt. As you can see here, this was produced for the US Rubber Company, uh, copyright 1965. And it's fascinating. It goes through much of what we've discussed previously, although it doesn't have a mascot, I think the Bell rocket belt in its own right and the person and the, the, uh, uh, the pilot who is using it uh, basically functions as a mascot um, in, his own, in his own way there. Uh, but it talks all about uh, using the Bell rocket, uh, rocket belt in order to um, uh, advance uh, flying capabilities. This was a product which was briefly uh, promoted and, try, and they tried to um, get the United States military involved and interested in this uh, rocket belt. Uh, and there was some interest for a while, but the, the, the product itself really only was able to fly for something along the lines of 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And then uh, that's as far as it could go. Um, so the military eventually lost interest, uh, but it did become a useful promotional uh, tool that, that they would take the uh, the rocket belt out and you know, on location to various uh, fairs and so on in order to show people uh, what it could do. So it became a useful promotion in its own right. And here's a comic just promoting it still further. And it's also tied in, in this case, with the Keds uh, shoe company, as you can see on the back. So it's fascinating. There's no end to these uh, comic books. They're all over the place. I keep finding more. Uh, if you know of any, I'd be happy to discuss the topic with you. So please reach out to Hagley Library and I'd love to speak to you about this topic if you have any questions or uh, other items to, uh, to discuss. So finally, I do want to thank you all for listening to this edition of the Hagley History Hangout. We release a new episode weekly. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and on Hagley's own resource page, hagley.org slash from home. Thank you.